My name is Jeff Eaton. I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia at the age of 22, and I had a recurrence and uh, a relapse at the age of 25. And I am an eight and a half year survivor. After my second transplant, I am also the founder and executive director of Young Adult Cancer Canada. And I approached my whole experience with cancer like a hockey playoff series. Um, I thought about it in those terms. I talked about it in those terms. I, uh, every round of chemotherapy to me was like a game in my series. Um, and the reason I did that, I think, was because it gave me a frame with which to visualize what I was going through. I had never fought cancer before, obviously. I had played hockey my whole life, and I'm a, a classic Canadian kid in that respect, I guess. It's, you know, it's part of my bone marrow. Um, so it just made sense to me that the mindset I used to bring to the hockey rink was going to work well in the hospital room. It gave me a visual frame to play this thing out. So when I was sick or in a lot of pain, I would kind of think about it as if I was playing hockey and push through it. It's almost competing with the pain or the chemo or whatever the case may be. I had moved out just you know as soon as I graduated from university and I had started my own little business and um, was having a great time growing that and being on my own and being 22 and doing all the things that a 22 year old often does. And um, then when I did get sick I, I had to let a lot of that go. I mean. I was obviously not going to be out hanging out with my buddies or playing hockey or working the way I was. Um, the therapy I had was too, too intensive, so um, I did move home. And the mixed blessing, you know, I'm incredibly fortunate to be able to have that opportunity, to have that family support. And then on the other side, obviously, uh, a real struggle to let go of your independence. Part of what I think makes having cancer at this age so challenging is that for a lot of us, um, we are just, or at the early stages, of getting to try out those dreams that we've been having for some or all of our life. I would never realized until I had chemotherapy how tired I would get by just having more than two people in my room. I didn't even have to be talking with them. I, just, I could just feel the energy drain right out of me. So I, I try to take control of that, and I think it's an important thing for patients to do. Take control of whatever environment you can, and then that allows you to align it to support whatever it is you feel your path to success is going to be. Take control of your environment, manage your energy, surround yourself with positive, comfortable, good things. So for me, that definitely included my own pillow, my own bed sheets, um, my own music, my sweats. like. I would move into a hospital room and I would do my best to make it like my room at home. And uh, it made a huge difference for me, those little tiny things. Um, so I mean, that's, that's a very practical thing, I think, is, is make it as much of home as you can. The first time I got sick with cancer, there was no doubt that I was going to get through it in my mind. I, I really believed that. The second time I got sick, I did not believe that at all. My foundation of confidence was eroded, basically, by the recurrence. Um, but I think I learned a lesson. I learned many, but the, I learned a big lesson because I didn't learn to slow down. I think that at some level, my second cancer diagnosis was teaching me to slow down because I was not very good at that. I went back to work, you know, arguably earlier than I should, and I certainly wasn't balanced when I went back to work. I had no energy and stamina to be out hanging with my friends or doing other things. I didn't have any supports to um, rehabilitate myself physically in any significant way. Um, and I didn't make it a priority either. Um, so I worked. It was easier to do. And I loved it. I loved what I was doing. Um, but my balance, again, was not there. And I think it's part of my lifelong challenge to achieve that. I think it's part of everybody's. When you're diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, the, the, the focus of the medical team is to get you started on chemotherapy so you don't die. And um, that was the case for me. And the issue of fertility didn't come up until we started to talk about bone marrow transplant. So when that possibility was, you know, potentially taken away from me, it was a real source of anger. For seven years I was sterile. So we, uh, we went to see a fertility doctor. She just basically looked at us and said no you'll never get pregnant naturally. And by that time, you would think I would have known. So 
someone tells me I'm not going to do something, that it's absolutely going to happen. But I didn't know that at the time. But less than two months later, um, I won't go into all the details, and <coughs> um, we find out we're pregnant. And uh, we are beyond excited. Um, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know how to describe what I felt. So Adia, our first little girl, was born the week of my fifth anniversary of my second transplant. Nine months after Adia was born, Karen says, I want to go back to work pregnant. So anyway, one month we tried and bang, we had another one. And Mira was born in March of 2008. So for each of them, the experience of having them kind of come into the world was without a doubt the most amazing experience of my life. I think two things that I did uh, to help deal with the fear, um, one was face it. So I attempted to not deny it. So if at any given moment I was having a little bit of a, I'll call a spiral of fear where I was thinking about what's going to happen if I die. Um, what does that look like for me and everybody else and my dreams and my hopes and my friends and my family and what does that look like? And I would actually let myself go there. I wouldn't deny that. And I would try to let myself go to all the bad places and then stay there for a while and get comfortable with it. I had varying success with that, but that's how, that's how I did it. The other thing that I did, which I think is a great philosophy for life, but I took risk. Um, the thoughts are there, <clears throat> but I tried not to let them hold me back. I took risk anyway. So I went back to work, and I tried to re-engage with other parts of my life that I really missed. And um, I opened myself up to something more and different than me. And um, my relationship with my wife was a major part of that. That was a, a major source of fear and a major risk for both of us, really. But um, those two things, I think, are, are really important for survivors to take, to think about on the other side. You know, it may not be something you can even comprehend when you're in the middle of treatment. But for me, when I got on the other side of that, it was, it was, being aware that the fear was there and diving into it and, and not allowing it to re prevent me from taking risks that were going to make my life a lot better. Because I think the risk-reward phrase is so true, so true. I felt like I had to figure out what this was all about because I wasn't quite sure. Why did I get cancer? why me and not one my buddy next to me who sat next to me in hockey for all those years and partied with me and went to school with me and why me and sometimes I ask that out of anger because you know there's lots of Friday nights when I was home and either just not well enough or didn't have the energy to go out um, well, but I really did want to and um, another part of me just really asked that why me question out of curiosity because I know that, I know as much as I know anything, that there's, there's something bigger going on and that we're all connected to it. And uh, I really believe, and to my new bone marrow, that um, everything happens for the right reason. It's a, a, a core belief of mine, for sure. And I guess I was interested to explore the reasons, to find out, you know, for me at least, why do I think this happened to me? I'm not sure that the, the reason or any other reasons was to start Young Adult Cancer Canada. But I just know that I wanted to do that. And it made sense for me, and it has been a, a healing mechanism for me. And um, I don't mean to say that I started it with selfish interests, but I guess you could argue at some level we all, everything we do is selfish. And um, there was a large part of me that wanted to help other young adults that were like me, and, but there was also a large part of me that was still trying to figure out what the hell happened. And I think the, the starting and growth of Yak was a, was a part of that, and it has helped tremendously. Um, it's allowed me also to, at some level, come out of the isolation that I was in.